Dominic, I th I've been looking forward to this, but I got to be honest with you. All right. I started to look at some of your work. I saw a lot of your work. But if I was going to look at all of your work before the interview, I'd have to take about six months, I think, and just binge on Dominic Lombardozzi. What haven't you been in? You've been every great film, every great television show, all the best. You're in it. Every single one of them. Well, first, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Um, I've been following you as well. Um, I, you know, I, I just been uh, I've been blessed. I really have. And um, I work with some really phenomenal people. And I, you know, I hope that continues. But um, well, it will. And I have to tell you, you know, um, you know, I had Chaz on recently. I saw that. Yeah. I, had, I had Lilo on recently. Saw and, that. And now I have you and all three of you really got your start in a Bronx tale. Trifecta. Yeah, yeah. trifecta. And I loved your character there. Zero. Because you know, your mom said you're never going to amount to anything. But, uh, yeah. you know, it was great. That was a great film. And, uh, you know, just you're all you're all great. Really, what Chaz did with that was kind of phenomenal, taking it from, you know, uh, a one man show and, and what he did and what he was able to accomplish and, and use that as a springboard for his for his career um, is, is is just amazing. I mean, me and Chaz were both from the same neighborhood. We're both. Uh, I grew up in that neighborhood. I remember casting uh, it, it just Mike when I mean, people, kids were coming from from everywhere because. De Niro didn't want actors. And I think Chaz had explained this yes. to you on, on his interview. So to make a long story short, it kind of dwindled down. And originally that role was called Nikki Four Eyes. And then it was changed to Nikki Zero, uh, I guess, to support that scene of the guns and, and everything like that. And uh, I possibly took a, they took their liberties with that character. But uh the important thing with that was I only worked one day. I only worked one day, one day. And it, my audition was with Chaz. And when I auditioned with Chaz, I knew my lines. I was 15, 14 years old, something like that. And, um, and I remember walking into the room, Chaz greeted me at the door. Casting brought me in. De Niro was in the back still on a phone call. Um, and Chaz goes, hey, you know, kid, are you ready? You're good. You want to look at it? And I go, no, no, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. And we did the scene. And by the time I got home, I got the part. And I worked one day. I was eligible for the union. And my mom took the money like you, I wanted to be a ball player. I'm 14. I wanted to play for the New York Yankees. Mm -hmm. I grew up on Arthur Avenue, 187th Street. And um, she took the money and made me join the union. Oh. And then it wasn't until years later. Now, as an act, I, I, I see how difficult it is to get a union card. Yeah. And it's really hard for me to give advice to some people how to do that because it just... It happened for me in such an unorthodox kind of way. I owe it to Chaz and I, I see Chaz. Chaz doesn't live too far from me. And uh, I, I owe it to him and I owe it to Bob, you know. Well, let me ask you, when you went into audition, did you really have to act or was that kind of your character? Because you grew up in the neighborhood. I wasn't a troublemaker. No, I wasn't. I wasn't that guy. You wouldn't know I was in a room. Really? Still, still. Um, very, very still. Very quiet? Very shy. Really? Yeah, very shy. Even now, I've said it before, I'm acting for me is therapeutic. It, all my insecurities that I carry with me, um, when I'm in front of the camera, they kind of disappear. So, but you gotta have you gotta have a lot of confidence in yourself because to be an I'll tell you this, uh, you know, I I've been a speaker, a public speaker now for the last 25 years. Yes. And I can't take my own notes up on the stage and read them because they distract me. I have to know everything and just speak from the heart. And I can't bring, read my own notes, which is crazy. It's not a good, you know, it's a, right. it's not a, it's a skill set I should have, but I don't have. You know, and I had a part in one movie that I reluctantly did. 
and I had like four pages of, uh, of uh, dialogue, and I told the, the writer, I said, are you out of your mind? I'm never going to remember this. I said, throw it out. I got to just think about it and speak what I want to say. And uh, so I, I, I was telling Chaz, too, I have a tremendous respect for actors. <laughs> I never realized just how difficult it is. And I was playing a character that was kind of like myself. But for mm -hmm. somebody like yourself to get into another character, and this is even more, if you're a, you know, normally kind of a shy guy, to get out there and just be somebody else and do it so well. Because you're, you're, you're terrific in all these roles, and I have to say that. I always Thank admired you. you. I mean that. I, I admired you. You, what you did. So. And, and before we even spoke, I, I, I saw interviews where you had mentioned me, and people would call me, you know, Michael Francis, you know, he mentioned you in this interview and, and, and everything. And um, so I, I, I really appreciate that, especially when uh, we spoke about the Irishman and you and you texted uh you dm'd me or something like that on on twitter i mean that meant a lot to me because i know you knew him personally yes and i had nobody to really talk to who didn't know him to i i i went based on tape at base i went based on news clippings i went based on um just regular information so to get that from you was a very, very uh, it meant a lot to me. No, you really nailed the role, and I knew him fairly well, and uh, you nailed it, and uh, that's why I had to, I had to tell you. How does it feel? How was it, you know, working with De Niro and and Pesci and and guys like this? I mean, you always seem to be with the the cream of the crop as far as uh, you know your roles, and, and these are these are amazing people that you're around all the time. Well, De Niro, that when I did The Irishman, that happened to be the third time I worked with De Niro. Uh, I worked with him, obviously, on, on A Bronx Tale, which was his directorial debut. I worked with him on this film we did, uh, a, a Luc Besson film, uh, which we shot in France called The Family with Michelle Pfeiffer and uh, Tommy Lee Jones. And, and, um, and then again on The Irishman. And I think it was Bob who kind of, sealed it because i remember the audition and um uh, 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 originally it was for two characters and i went in right for the casting director normal process with ellen lewis who's a phenomenal who's kind of an iconic casting director here in new york and she said you know they called and said yeah they're very interested you know they're very interested please don't cut your hair <laughs> don't cut my hair okay a month goes by, two months go by. Now, me, look at me, mm -hmm. Michael, okay? Yeah. When I start growing my hair out, I start looking like Burt Young from Rocky, okay? <laughs> really? yeah. Not good. So I, I told my man, I said, you know, can you call and can you find out what's going on? You know, and, and sure enough, they said, well, then said, can you meet Marty such and such? Absolutely. Met Marty, Bob comes in. And they just start asking me some questions and, and, you know, Bob gives me a hug. He, I mean, he knows me since I'm 15 years old mm -hmm. and uh, very general kind of questions. And it happened to be, they were, they were thinking about me for Tony, for fat Tony, which was a little odd to me because he, he was so much older and in the film, they were aging everybody else down. I wasn't going to complain about it. Bob just said, okay, you know, yeah, okay, that, you know, that's what it is. Okay, okay, okay. Meeting was finished. Bob said, you know, let me talk to Marty and, uh, some, you know, somebody will, will call you again. I was in the car on the West Side Highway. Ellen Lewis calls, says they, they want you in the movie. Now I'm working. I love De Niro. But for me, it was always Pesci, always Pesci. I knew I know Pesci always I don't want to say he stole every scene, but he was just almost flawless where you couldn't take your eyes off of him. And he was the one guy who I could always relate to the most. He was my guy. So working with him was um, was pretty, pretty damn special, you know especially in that film. Yeah, I mean, I love Taishi. He plays the crazy wise guy better than anybody. I mean, he's just terrific in that role. And, yeah. then, and he had a total departure of that role in The Irishman. He was a totally different character. And he nailed it again, too, because I knew that fellow very well. 
Uh, he's just great. He, he really is. You mentioned you actually mentioned something really, really um, important uh, about Al, actually, which I mention it all the time. I've been saying it for years. One of his best performances was in Donnie Brasco. Yes. Because nobody understands. I think the majority of the people don't understand what a broken wise guy looks like. And there were a lot of them. He played it brilliantly. You're like, oh, you know, they, they, they can't separate. I think when it came to that film, they couldn't separate Al from, the, from Michael Corleone. But growing up in, in a neighborhood that I was surrounded by that, you know, and I, I, I seen it. I seen it. And he could have been any one of those guys. Well, Dom, you know, you're right. He, uh, most of the guys are his character. You know, everybody thinks in that life, I mean, the, the Godfather and some of the other films lend such a dignity to so many, you know, to characters in that movie, obviously, you know, there was a dignity about many of them, uh, but that's not how it really is. Most of the guys, you know, I tell this all the time, in the Colombo family, we had, uh, during my time, we had 115 made guys, guys that took the oath. Out of the 115, maybe 20 of us were real earners that we were bringing money in. The rest of the guys were just like Al was in that movie. You know, they were just guys that trying to, you know, scrape through, who had a gambling problem, who's, you know, who's got a no-so job with the union, who's doing something, hijacking. A lot of guys were just getting by and doing that kind of stuff. And he he played that character just, to me, it was his best role, without a doubt. Yeah. When I look at these movies, and I wanted to ask you about something, it, to me, yeah. It's the authenticity that means everything, you know? And that's why you're so good, because when you play these characters, you play them like I knew the guys on the street, same way. And that's important to me. That's how I kind of judge all of these films. And uh, Pacino, I don't think he grew up around this, but he, he certainly nailed it. And even De Niro, I don't, I don't know his background that much, but you know, they get into the character pretty, pretty darn good. And you, you know, you come out of the Bronx, I'm sure you're around guys. If you're around Arthur Avenue, you must have seen, you know, plenty of guys hanging out there. Right. So, you know, you, you nail the role and that's what makes the movie for me. But Tony Salerno, it was important for me to find like little certain things, like obviously him chewing on the cigar. When he sat in a chair, he turned the chair around and he was always like this uh, kind of kind of thing. So those little it wasn't much, there wasn't a really big pond to fish in a lot of information out of, you know, because then again, that family were kind of like the Ivy League. Mm -hmm. No one knew anything. And if you didn't know something, you, you had to doubt it. So I went with what I had. Again, you, you nailed the role for sure. Uh, it was just great. And the movie was great. You know, a lot of people, I, I can tell you this. I know for a fact that the story wasn't true. I know that Sheerhan was not the shooter. I know that right. some people say different things, but that's been proven. But the movie itself was was just great. I mean, with all the the the, uh, the cast that you had in there, Scorsese, he, he can't make a bad film. I don't think I don't think you guys know how to make a bad film. Really, it was. Yeah, it was Marty great. did. Marty did a really great job with that movie. He really did, and and I'm glad he kept it the. The, the length that he kept it because I think I think their intentions were maybe not necessarily to tell the truthful story was basically to tell this particular person's story and to adapt that book. And I'm glad he didn't, you know, the movie's got to be uh, two hours long or something like, I think it needed to be that, that long in order for everything else to make sense. Yeah. I agree with you. So I agree with you. I don't have a problem watching a long movie as long as it's a, uh, as long as I find it interesting, you know? I'm the same. Back in the old days, I would say, movies were long all the time. And me, I, well, 70s, you had to go in a cinema, yeah? It's a good movie, put me in a seat, give me some popcorn, and I'm ready to watch three hours. I don't care. I love the movies. I love it. Yeah. I have nothing to rush to. So. <laughs> well, let I'm me ask saying. you this. Out of, out of, and this is probably a difficult question. Out of every role that you've played, <clears throat> television and, and movies, do you have a favorite? I have a few. There are projects and characters I like for all different reasons. Uh, the character on Ray Donovan, uh, the Mac character, I really like that character because uh, it was a little outside of the box what I, I had normally played. Although big, intimidating kind of guy, he was emotionally the weakest guy in the room. 
the writing, the people I was acting were top notch and the constant pivoting of emotion within scenes with uh, that carry throughout. I really enjoyed that challenge. I really felt I, I earned everything. The Wire, uh, working in Baltimore, working with those guys, the her character. I mean, I, I, li- I like them for all different reasons, whether I don't necessarily always like the character that I'm playing. The fine line with that is when I play that character, I have to love that character. In order for me to sell that character, I have to love him. But then in retrospect, I don't want to play a bully cop. I don't want to play um, a conniver or, or a, a stool pigeon or, or some, something like that. Something that I don't admire. You know what I mean? But to play the role, you have to embrace it. And the only way you embrace it is to acknowledge that 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 that's what the person is and that's what you're going to be. And 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 for that to f- feel truthful, you got to live with it for that for that amount of time. But many projects. Uh, I did a role in a show called Mrs. Fletcher that was on HBO and I loved the role. Played just a normal guy who was a plumber a son of a plumber whose father had dementia. And I loved it. I loved it. I, I love parts that are, are a little outside of the box, you know, but I like gigs and, and certain shows and movies from the relationships I make, the people I'm working with, the project as, as a whole. So it, it's, it's hit or miss, but I don't have one particular thing. Well, I loved the, the Ray Donovan series. I was so into that. I mean, everybody was brilliant in that uh, in that series. You know, one thing um, that I've noticed in the last couple of years, the writing for television series has been just unbelievably good. I mean, top notch. I don't know where these writers are coming from, Don, but the storylines are just amazing. And you know, in the way. And, and to keep that up for season after season, and, and they're doing it. I mean, you're so engrossed in these series. It's unbelievable. Well, so some of these, uh, I think a lot of people from film have made the transition to TV. Cable, streaming TV, serialized shows. I think a lot of people, you, you see actors making the transition. I'm more inclined to watch probably a show than a film. Well, do you have a preference though in uh, in doing a movie or doing a television series? I like I like doing a TV show. I like creating a character and collaborating with all these different type of people and seeing how many colors can we bring out. Well, you know that was a little bit of a selfish question because you know I got this TV series in development now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and well, I uh, told you I'll be there. You know, oh, no, no, one hundred percent for me. I'll you know the, uh, the the writer is Ron Shelton. He's a great writer, brilliant, and he. Uh, I told him, I said, Ron, you're gonna do. A, I know you're gonna make a brilliant pilot. You're gonna do a brilliant job, but you're gonna have a problem with the dialogue. I said, guarantee. You didn't come out of Brooklyn or the Bronx, and you don't know the way these characters talk. He said, Michael, I'm gonna hand it over to you, and you make whatever corrections that you want. So he gave me the first draft, and sure enough, structure and storyline, terrific, really terrific. But the dialogue. Yeah, really, I was so happy with it. But the dialogue, you know, I helped him out with it. And uh, we should have the final draft in about a week. So, and your your name is right up there, bro. I want you in there. So, selfish reasons. Uh, well, let me know. Yeah. Well, let me know, Michael. No, it's going to be good. And uh, But I'm glad you say that because uh, TV for me has been terrific. And now we haven't seen a movie in, in almost a year now with uh, you know, yeah. coming out of the pandemic. But hopefully now it's opening up. But uh, let me ask you, a lot of preparation. Do you, I mean, really have to get into your character? Do you have to close yourself in a room for two days and become that person? How does it work? I do. It starts with the Bible. It starts with the script. It starts learning the script. I'm dyslexic, so it takes me a long time to go through the script and then breaking down the character. Sometimes if it's something new or or if you're jumping on a show and you're doing a recurring and, you know, those are the tough ones. The tough ones are the characters that get created on a show that's already a well-oiled machine. 
So you, it's kind of like hopscotch. You're jumping in and you just have to go. You have to be ready to go. Mm. So you create these little things. You create these little backstories that that aren't given to you. Little things that anyway, me, that's what I do. But I'm able to leave it at work. But when I'm working, you know, I don't really goof off or, you know, it's just try to stay as focused as possible. And and I wouldn't say I'm Daniel Day-Lewis method. I'm not that. But then again, I haven't had a role that needed that much, you know, who knows, maybe I would if I had the chance to play or play any of those kind of roles. But um, always, it's always in the back of my mind. I could be at a barbecue doing a movie and I'm saying lines in the back of my head, little things, you know, it's like you're not even aware of it. When you're doing a character, the way you drink something, the way you walk, the way you look, the way you react to something, there is this prep that happens and it will stay with me. It's kind of like a routine, always the same thing, very repetitive, same thing, drink this before you go on. I'm just very superstitious that way. You're back to being Dominic Lombardozzi, but off the set, you're still thinking of the character. Always. Always. Yeah. Not only what I'm I'm going to be doing, but I'm thinking of a scene that I shot two weeks ago. And it's also because a lot of these things are shot out of chronological order. I'm always, yeah, but this, I would, uh, I would you know, um, my mood, I, I was thinking about this, this happened. Th- Meanwhile, you could go to the script supervisor and the script supervisor could tell you, yeah, you know, this happened after you were in the car and you came out and you guys had the fight, blah, 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 blah. But I need to know it. I need to know it without asking her. And that's what keeps me focused. I've always said this. I have no problem stubbing a line. No problem doing that. If I'm in a rhythm and I'm trying to find something, my biggest fear is not being prepared at work saying, oh, you know what? I fucked off. I went to the bar. I had a couple of drinks. I, I kind of like skimmed through this stuff. That will never happen. Let me ask you, what if you, you know, you got your lines and you don't like the dialogue? It doesn't feel right to you in that scene. Can you go at that point to the, uh, to the director and say, hey, can I try something else? I think this might work a little bit better. It all depends who you're working with. Uh, some people are really married to the words. It's very important for them. And I try to give the writers what they put on the page and try to make it work. Chances are sometimes they're either the writers on set or that for that particular episode, that that writer is there and they, and they could see that it's not working. They could see something ain't right. So they will try to help you with that. But, you know, you make it work. It's just like a mason, you know, he has a stone. It doesn't fit. And he got, you got to chisel it until it gets into that slot. I heard uh, Scorsese, though, he kind of allows some liberty. Yeah, that, he gives room. He gives room. Yeah. That, that whole scene in Goodfellas with Pesci at the bar, that couldn't have been in the script. <laughs> you know? No, I, th- I think Joe even said that was improvised. The uh, you're making me you, you, you think I'm a clown. I think oh, the, here, here's what it is. Joe had told them the story. I, I, I think this is how it goes. Don't hold me to it. But I think you, you could research this. And I think it was in an interview. I think Joe had told them the story that kind of happened. So they were doing the scene. They were doing the scene. And, and Marty, like, and which makes perfectly sense after working with them, goes, you know, Joe, Joe, just, just you know, just t- t- tell him that story. Tell him the story. And probably Joe told him the story and and everybody to everybody's credit around him. They play, they, they stay, everybody stayed in the scene. Mm -hmm. Everybody stayed in the scene. Ray stayed in the scene. All the, uh, the day players, they stayed in the scene. The extras, they stayed in the scene. That was the beauty of, of that, of how, why that worked. Well, Henry in that scene, he looked like he was really like, he didn't know it was coming. I mean, I almost thought, I said to myself when I wanted, did he really know that was coming? Because it looked like he did. He, he froze for a minute. I, I think that's genuine when he goes, oh, he, 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 you're fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I think that's genuine. Pesci goes, ah, I almost fucking got you. I yeah. almost fucking got I think that's a genuine moment, it's you true. know? 
So I guess, and it all depends on the director and then and what's going on at the time and that. Film. Yeah. You know, sometimes in TV, you know, which is more of a writer's medium, film, more of a director's medium. Look, there are writers who want you to say every word. To them, it makes sense. To them, it makes sense. And it's my job to give them what they want. It's just the way it is. I never say, oh, this is my character. It's not my character. It's their character. It's my job to bring out those colors. If I sat down and I wrote the character, then, yeah, it is my character. But initially, it's theirs. And if it's a, a show that's a series that's ongoing, it's a collaboration. It's a work in progress. You sound like you're easy to work with, Tom. Right? Yeah, I, I love to work. You know, let, let me ask you, growing up in the Bronx, you were on Arthur Avenue a lot. Did you know many yeah, of the guys? We, you know, we didn't. Yeah, I was always in the streets. Not not in the streets doing bad things. But, you know, um, I was always late for dinner. I was always playing sports. I was always, uh, you know, I'm somewhat product of my environment. But I, I got to tell you, at a very young age, I was able to see about uh, on the other side of the fence. When the baseball was, I, you know, the acting thing came along, I knew there was a bit of a difference. The way I would talk or the way I would refer, refer to uh, about other people, it was just a bit more sensitive when it came to that kind of stuff. And it wasn't until I did my second movie that uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Tony Vitale, he wrote and directed this thing and we raised the money for this film. It was called Kiss Me Guido. I actually fell in love with acting, I fell in love with the entire process because it was a very guerrilla independent film. And I saw what I actually saw what everybody's job was. And I think it's important as an actor to know what everybody does, kind of like what Ray Lewis, right? Ray Lewis, probably one of the best linebackers, right? Ray Lewis knows everybody's job. One of my mentors, uh, Phil Rosenthal, and if you're a writer, you should take an acting class. If you're an actor, you should take a writing class or a directing class. You need to see what's on the other side and where they're coming from in order to collaborate sometimes because it could get messy. Did you think just from uh, where you grew up, did you think that you were going to gravitate towards the roles that you had? The wise guy role, or maybe the tough cop role. Did you think that's where you were headed? Yeah, I mean, I'm still, I'm still. I've said it before. I'm still singing and dancing for my food, and it's still hard to try to convince people sometimes that that's not me. But I have a few people in the business, a few casting directors. Uh, I had her on my podcast, like Sherry Thomas, and most recently Whitney Horton, uh, who are fantastic casting directors who think outside the box for me, who will bring me in. I'm not saying I'm going to get it, but they see, they, they understand. And it's, it's hard to change how people think. I mean, big movie stars, yeah. big movie stars get typecast, but to make a career, somebody had to do it, right? Somebody had to do it. And it was always my, you know, I'm very blue collar, I come from a very, very blue collar family. I'm first generation American. I know it's about work, it's about family. Everything's about work and family. You work to support your family. And it's always been important for me to just keep working. Work gets work, I guess, you know? Yeah, you know, when you say that, I have, uh, there's a lot of great actors, yourself included, that this is a job to you. It's a career, it's a job, it's, uh, you know, it's something you love doing. And there's not a lot of controversy outside of what you do. You know, and there's some some people in that role that you're always hearing about them some way, shape, or form, outside the box, whatever they're doing, or who they're having an affair with, everything, you know what it's like. But then there's somebody like yourself that, hey, this is my career, this is my craft, this is my job, I take it seriously, and when I'm done with it, I, I'm just now. You might see me at Home Depot bitching because I can't get a car. <laughs> car. Okay? That's okay. Because people like to, to like go to Gucci and, and shop and like Maserati dealers. I could stay in Home Depot for about two hours and just, uh, you know, I need that drill. I really do. I need that sander. You know, I need that level. And that's what I'm doing. Yeah, I, I'm, I go to the store. I, I, I look like I'm a landscaper. 
Yeah, you know, so um, I'm, and, and I love, I'm fine with that. I like, I like my hands dirty. I like my hands rough. Um, that's just the type, and so, which is great because when I am doing a role, that doesn't exist. Right. That doesn't exist, and that's that separation that I was talking about before. You get noticed a lot in Home Depot. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, yeah. I get noticed, you, you know, and people are really flattering and people are really nice. And, I, you know, and um, it feels good. You know, it feels good to someone, you know, see something you, you've you done. And um, but I, I don't need it. I don't need it. Yeah, but it's great. I don't, I don't need the table at the restaurant. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't need that. So, so you're still blue collar all the way. So it's good. Before I came here. I was fertilizing my holly trees. <laughs> hey. I shit not. Well, I, no, I believe it. I believe it. That's yeah. great. That's great. You know, it's good when you can step out of what your, you know, your craft is and just be yourself. You know, right. Ch- Chaz and I were talking about that. And he seems to be the same kind of guy. He said, Michael, I, you know, I like a lot of things that he said. He also said, you know, when he does the one man show on Broadway, you know, He'll uh, he'll go outside. It might be cold outside, but there's people waiting in line, you know, to shake his hand. And, and he said that he'll always do all the time. Yeah, and that's he's, a good. Chaz is great. Chaz will stop what he's doing and talk to a fan. I've seen him do it. I've been around him, and I've seen him do it. And um, that's no lie. But can you imagine the rush that he gets? doing that one man show on stage and rocking that, that, that little, whatever theater he's in, I don't, you know, 200 P I don't know what it is, but um, I'm glad, I'm glad he's able to experience that. It makes me happy that he, 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 um, it makes me happy that this, this little thing that he created has blown up into so many, has so many different veins, you know? And, um, I'm really happy for him. I really am. He deserves it. I mean, to do, you know, you're right. For that one man show, I don't know how you even, I haven't seen it, but I'm going to see it now. I, I'm seeing it in reverse. I've seen the, the movie and then I'll see that. But to do 18 characters like that is, I, I can't even think of that, you know? It's crazy. I can't wait to see it. But let me, have, you ever want to direct? That's the goal. That's it, huh? It seems that's that almost almost every actor, that's the goal. They want to direct. Why is that? Possibly the, it's a natural progression, maybe. Maybe it's so many years being, for me, it's so many years being on set that sometimes you find yourself saying, um, I would tell this story a little differently. I would put the camera here. I would start here. I would, I would uh, maybe do a tracking shot or I would, you know, I, I do it all the time, constantly thinking of that, how to tell a story of visually, that is, right? So I think that's somewhat of a natural progression for an actor, uh, producing, creating something, seeing something from infancy to the end. You're directing something. If you're directing a movie, you're with that movie for about three years. Talk about really creating something. For a serious actor, a natural progression is hey, we want to direct and we want to see how we, we can make this film. But this, it's so time-consuming. I mean, there's so much involved. You just said, it. I don't think people realize that when you're with a project like that, you're with it for years, for years. Yeah. And it's constant, you know. Some, some directors are with it. You know, you have directors that come on to a project that's already set up at a studio. Now, imagine a director that a project is not set up at a studio and selling the project and casting and locations and script and rewrites. And look, there's a movie you write, a movie you shoot and a movie you edit. And none of the three are the same. Right. Okay. so now think about this. You prep the movie. You shot the movie. Now you're in post. Now you're creating what you think you have or what you think you might have want to show people. Mm -hmm. It's a whole other process. You're with that thing for a really, really long time. And then you're selling the movie. Right. So it's a long, it's a long, I have a lot of respect for directors, um, especially uh, writer directors. 
No, I have respect for everybody in the process too, but you know, even in this thing that we do here in these YouTube videos, I have so much respect for our editors because they, they make it come alive, you know, and, and, and in a movie where you have so many, so much footage of film, to put that all together in a cohesive way to tell a story, it's, it's, that's a lot of work. It's amazing. I've watched a lot of editors. It's a lot of work. Takes a village, Michael, yes. you know? You yes. know, it's like, it's like I, I really believe in the saying, you know, it takes a village to raise a child, yeah. you know? Uh, you see it, you see it in certain people that will, come from a certain type of family and, and a certain type of environment. And I think the same thing when it comes to film, it's a work in progress for everybody from the editor. From, you, that role right there is, is so crucial. You have a finished product. You have all these takes, you have all these, these things. Now let me hand it to this person mm -hmm. and let me, this person help me put these together. Or sometimes you just hand it to them and you, you let them do a cut. Right. You know, and then you go back and forth uh, for everybody. I guess it's different. A lot of people involved. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing process uh, from start to finish. Uh, unbelievable. Let me let me ask you this. How did you uh, how did you handle the lockdown and the pandemic? I, I get asked that all the time. How did you get through it? What did you do? Uh, for me, honestly, um, I got to tell you this. You know, I I normally travel just about every week. I do probably 70, 80 dates a year speaking and shut down during the pandemic, and I got a little spoiled. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to travel anymore. You know, I mean, I enjoyed being home. It was the first time in like 25 years that I said, hey, I'm home, I know my house. Hey, yeah. these are my kids, you know, I mean, it was great. Um, so for me, it was, a, it was kind of a blessing because things, you know, the whole YouTube channel came, was born out of that, and this coaching that I'm now doing was born out of the pandemic. So for me, you know, and you don't want to be offensive to the people that struggle through it. It, uh, right. you know, it worked in my favor in some ways. Now, obviously, you know, I don't mean that to be, again, offensive to anybody. But how did you handle it? It was a little scary. You know, my, you know, my mom has ALS. Uh, so my mom is in bed. Um, so it was important for me, you know, to quarantine, to be really strict about that. So it was a little scary in the beginning, constantly not trying to get sick. And then, you know, on top of that, you're not working. So you try to occupy your time that way. And you really couldn't do anything for that first year. And then, you know, the, the summer came and things got a little lenient. But for me, really couldn't. It, it, I just got my second shot. Got my second shot last week. So I'm, all, I'm completely vaccinated. And uh, but yeah, I, I've always had to be careful because I'm around my mom. How did I call? I don't know. I binged on TV shows. Watched you on YouTube. <laughs> I'm and, glad. Uh, you know. I'm glad and, I gave uh, you at least an hour. Say the time. same thing. Oh, you know, <laughs> people, you, you would think people would get creative during that podcast and actually something a little off the cuff. Yeah. You know, you did some really, really good interviews. I, I personally think the best one you did was with um, Value Entertainment. What was his name? Um, Patrick um, Ben David. Patrick Ben David? Yeah. Is that, am I saying it correctly? Yeah, Patrick Ben David. Patrick Ben David, yeah. yeah, that was a that was a that was a really good one. Everybody's got a YouTube channel. It's been becoming a crowded space with ex mob guys or guys that say they were associated with the life. I mean, I had two guys uh, in Florida. I forget the guy's name. Six months ago, they started talking about me, and they turned to the camera and they said, "Francis, we're coming for you. We're coming for you. We're coming for you." And I'm saying, "Really? Nobody. Yeah. Never seen him. Never heard him. Never heard him since. I mean, they, nobody came for me." I don't know who they are, but I'm just saying everybody's, you know, YouTube seems to be the thing now. Get up there, do a yeah. podcast or whatever. And I mean, I'm included in that, so I can't knock it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm one of them, but. I got to tell you, I did my podcast. I I did my podcast. I set it up, to be perfectly honest, it was set up um, when the Irishman came out. So people would call me to do that podcast. So I would. And what wind up happening is when I was on their podcast, I would kind of ask them questions. And it was a great hour, hour and a half talking with them. And people would see it and people were like, oh, well, maybe you should start your own podcast. I said, you know what, man, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I should. And I asked my buddy, I said, I'll do it if you produce it. It was just to talk to people, to, to find out, you know, if someone could learn about them and if I can make money during the process, that's great. But um, it was mostly uh, for 
having people on. And if there's a person out there listening, because it's a very, very slow build. I'm not in the witness protection program. I don't have stories about killing people, you know? So when, when you have that, next thing you know, you have 5,000 pe- viewers, 10,000 viewers, 25, because they want to hear who did Tommy Karate kill. I don't have stories like that. I talk to regular people. I talk to people within the business and people who have important things to share and information. And if anybody who's listening could pick up and learn something from it, it's all worth it to me. But it's a very, very slow build. I know. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that you say that because so Dom's many guys, dead, by the way, Dom's Den. Dom's Den. Yes, Dom's Den. I don't know how to plug it. How to plug it. You know, so many of the guys that have these podcasts now, they they were in the witness protection program. They do have immunity for a lot of things that they did, and they can talk about it, you know. And uh, I'm not in that category. I can't talk about certain things. You know, I spent 20-plus years in that life, but I never had immunity for certain things. And, uh, you know, so I don't talk about it. It's not where I'm coming from anyway, Dom. You know, I'm not I'm not looking to uh, to glamorize all of that stuff, you know. I've told people this, and, and I mean it. Look, I was part of that life. My dad was part of that life, you know, so I'm familiar with it my entire life. But what I've tried to tell people, it, it's really a, um, it's an evil lifestyle. And the reason I say that, I'm not calling the guys evil. I was one of them, and I don't judge people like that. But the lifestyle itself, I don't know any family of any member of that life that hasn't been totally devastated including my own, now, not, not my wife and children, but my mother, father, brothers, sisters. I mean, and, and every member of that life, it, it always turns out the same all the time. And people don't realize that. So any lifestyle that does that to families is, is a bad lifestyle. And, um, you know, so I don't want to glamorize it in that way. I'll tell stories about it because things that happen and it's interesting. There's no question about it. I had a lot of experiences, but, you know, we're not here to glamorize that life. And I, I think a lot of people that, are listening in to some of the guys, there is a glamour to some of the things that they're saying. And, you know, it's almost like they're watching a movie. It's, it's, it's you know, but they're telling true mm-hmm. stories. At least that they say they're true stories. Who knows, you know? But uh, it's, it's very interesting that they have such audiences that so many people are tuning in. And I'm saying, wow, you know, people just like to hear this stuff. They really do. Well, I think, I think, I think, I think there's, there's an attraction to other people's misery, you yeah. know? Yeah, that might be a good way to put it. It's true. But anyway, listen, you know, YouTube, again, it's a crowded field, but hey, I guess the more the merrier. Who knows? And, and yeah. you're, you're still doing your podcast, right? Yeah. I'm going to have you on um, soon. Great. You know, well, obviously, I got to wait now because I did yours. So. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> You know, maybe after this sit down, you know, you can yeah. come on and talk, be online, you know. A- anytime. Uh, anytime. Yeah. No, no problem there. What else you got going I was like, on? Oh, Francis beat me to the punch. <laughs> you know? Like, okay. Well, you knew I was yeah. going to call you on this. You knew that. Let me ask, what do you got going on now? Anything interesting? Anything happening? Um, I just uh, did a, an episode of, of uh, Mrs. Maisel, and I finished up my little arc on Billions. And um, back on the market. So, but right now, just tending my garden, my vegetable garden, uh, spending time with the family, and you know, um, staying very close to my mom. Wow, well, I hope she does well. And guaranteed, you're going to be hearing from us soon, no doubt okay. about it. And uh, listen, I'm not the producer or director, but I do have some pull here. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> okay. You know, but I, I don't need it with you, Dom. I mean, come on. You're terrific in all these roles. We I'm sure you pull time. a lot of weight. Huh? I'm sure you pull a lot of, a lot of weight. Well, yeah. we'll see. <laughs> It'll be fun. All right. Uh, I'm man. curious to see what happens with it. I, I really hope it, uh... it it comes to fortune for you because, uh, you know, people only see part of your story here. Your story has been told in our increments, okay? And then, you know, another question to come in that part of the... So nothing has ever really been flushed out. The most important thing you said that hardly anybody talks about is the devastation it does to the family. I've seen it. Mm-hmm. I've seen it. I've seen what the RICO Act does. Yeah. Devastating. Innocent guys. Forget it. Forget it. Forget if you're a legitimate criminal. 
Okay, and you go away, you get convicted, you take your time, you do, you do, you have, you know, they're hitting people with jer- uh, football jersey numbers, right? And I kind of understood what you were saying with Chaz about the fear and the love, and and I get it, and I get it, because you're thinking if someone loves you, they'll take that rap, they'll do those 25, 30 years because they legitimately love you, as if like if like if I had to do time for my brother, I'd absolutely, and now boom. Give me the 30 years. You know, I'm not going to flip. I'll never do that. But the fear is like, uh, you know, I, I, I'd rather take my chances going on the run or on the lamb from you as opposed to doing the 35 years or the life year. And, and pr- I take my chances running from you as opposed. Now that, you know, it's it's kind of reverse. I understand. I understand what, what you meant. 20 years ago, if you were feared... It was different. It was different. It's more than that, Dom. What happened in our life is that the fear of our life, you know, our boss and what could happen to us, was transferred to the government. Because what happened with when the RICO laws came in and they changed everything, they would grab a guy and they'd say, hey, look, this is the deal. You're going away for the rest of your life. You're going to do 30, 40 years. There's no more parole. you got to do 85%. We'll put you in a witness protection program. We'll take care of you, your family. Don't worry about it. You guys are going away forever. So what do you got to worry about? We'll give you a new identity. We'll give you money. And now, you know, the fear is I don't want to do that jail time. And the government's right. offering you protection and everything else. So, you know, the fear is transferred to the government. But if you love somebody, you know, you're not going to break. You're not going to break. And you say, well, hey, here's a, a lot of these interviews. And this is how it usually goes. It goes like this. It goes. Yeah, I, you know, I went into this life. I admired this life. I went into this life. I did this. I did that. The reason why I decided to flip was because these people were talking bad about me. These people were the ones that were ratting or or a person who was a higher, who was a captain or whatever. That's not the point. The point is, you went against what you signed up for, regardless of what these people are doing. That's the part that's hard for me to understand. That's the part that's hard for me to say, eh, I, I can understand what you. No, I really can't understand because no, if 20 people in your family were ratting, doesn't mean that you have the right to be you. You signed up for that. You know what I mean? That's an ongoing common denominator in a lot of these these podcasts and stuff like that that I see, which I don't get it. You know what, Dom? I, I'm going to tell you something. That's it, it's amazing that you just pointed that out because most people don't see that. Most guys that went into the program or snitched or whatever, what they say is, hey, this guy did me wrong and that guy did me wrong and I had no choice and I had to do it and the mob is no good and it can't. It's all nonsense. The bottom line is they don't want to go to jail. And listen to me. I've sat through five trials of my own. I sat through four of my fathers, okay, that I've actually sat through. I have never seen an informant get on the stand, left hand on a Bible, right hand swear to tell the truth, and then lie through their teeth. They don't want to go to jail. They make all these excuses up. This guy was going to come after me, and they broke their word, and the mob is no good. But you just hit it. None of that matters. This is what we signed up for. We took the oath. Yeah. We knew we weren't going into, you know, a, these weren't choir boys. These are street yeah, guys. Listen, listen. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not in that life. I, 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 I don't know what it is to be in that position. Like at that stature, you know, it's what you signed up for. I'm sure you know there are a lot of people who were affected by the RICO Act just because they know this particular person and they sat down in the cafe. So now they're conspiring or whatever. I feel bad for those families. I really feel bad for those families that a person gets tangled into something just because they know them or they knew them 12 years ago. or They're having a slice of pizza with them. You, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's a little ridiculous, but families being hurt, you, you know, that is a definite that is a definite. Well, then, you know, it's like, you know, back in the day, you're either going to jail or you're going to the grave. Exactly. And you know that, but you know that. You know that when you took that old, you know, I mean, it never went through it. But from hearing everybody, 
that's what it is. Well, it's the guys that go into the program that try to make themselves honorable by saying, these guys turned on me or whatever, whatever excuse they use. And I would bet anything that I have that it's all about not wanting to go to prison. That's that's the bottom line. I, and, and I just, I can't say I understand it or I agree with it, but you know, in a way I do understand it, but it's wrong. You know, I'll, I'll point to my dad. There's two ways to look at, you know, my father and I'll discuss it now. It's personal, but I'll discuss it. No matter what, okay, he knew that when he and I talked privately, he said, Mike, there's a lot of things wrong with this life. A lot of things happen. And my father got screwed in a big way by guys uh, without getting into it. But that didn't matter to him. He said, hey, I took an oath and that was it. And I'm going to die with my boots on. He said, I'm never going to. It doesn't matter who I'm mad at. It doesn't matter who hurt me. It doesn't matter who passed over me. That's my principle. On the other hand, you know, my family was destroyed as a result of that. So, you know, there's a lot of damage that's done. But the fact that he stood up like that, it's, it, that was his mentality. Exactly what you said. You know, I took the oath and none of the other stuff matters. You know, this is the oath that I got to stand by. So there is some nobility in that. When I look at it the other way, I said, okay, dad, but our whole family was destroyed as a result of this. So there's two ways to look at it, but still. Michael, that's made very clear, though. That is made very clear when you're uh when you're inducted into that life that's right it's it's made very clear that your family comes second to this one that you're you're exactly made right very, and your and your father good or bad good or bad he followed that through to i think he was 103 years old right 103 yep there you go good or bad i'm not saying it's the right thing i'm not saying it's the right thing but when he was inducted into that life, he was made aware of that. Yes. Just and like everybody else, you know? He lived by the oath and he died by the oath. And, yeah. And, and Rarity. Yes. And in my case, when I walked away, I wasn't mad at anybody. You know, we all have our ups and downs in that life. You know, you, you get screwed sometimes. Sometimes you screw somebody. But I wasn't looking to hurt anybody. I didn't turn. I didn't say, hey, I was treated in the wrong way. So that wasn't my, I just wanted out of the life because I wanted to preserve my family. That was it for me. It was all about family. Mm -hmm. But, right. um, you know, you're, you're right. A lot of, but what gets me today is that so many guys are, are talking about so many things and they have such huge audience. It's people want to hear this stuff, no matter what. Who got killed? Who did I baseball bat? Who did I do this to? And yeah. uh, it, it's more amazing for me that the pe people are there that really want to hear it really want to hear real life stuff true crime like that true crime is huge we know but i don't know it's a, it's kind of fascinating to me it's not so much the person telling the story it's more the people that are listening to it i don't care so much about uh personalizing stories and stuff like that I was always fascinated with that that genre and not not organized crime or anything like that because i grew up in an area where that was around you know some of the other stuff like the serial docs and stuff like that i really get into those things <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I do. I kind of get lost into those. But I, was, um, I love the true crime stuff too. I mean, I'm, I'm one of those guys. But I, and, yeah. and I like, you know, the writing is so good. It's like Ray Donovan, and and all the, everything is so good in this. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. terrific. So you got to you become a junkie with this stuff. What are you going to do? Yeah. And what are you going to do with COVID, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But anyway, Dom, look, this was terrific. I don't want to keep you forever because we could talk for the rest of the afternoon. We'll do it again. I want to save some for when I come on your podcast. Absolutely. All right. I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope your mom is, is doing well and, and, you know, take good care of her. It's great. Thank you. And, Thank uh, you. and we'll speak shortly again. Absolutely. I'll stay in touch. And you're stay gonna be, safe, Michael. You're going to be getting a call from me soon on the show. I promise you. Let's do it. All right. All right. Okay. Be take well. care now. Bye-bye.